Friends, very good to see you. Uh, nice to rejoin you after a little break. James, nice to see you too. Yes, nice to see you too also, Ian. Yeah, good to be back. I hope you've had a good break. Refreshing? We did. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Oh. Northumberland was excellent. Mm. And you look so you caught a bit of sun too. Apparently the sun shines in Northumberland as well as down south, so that's all very good, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so we're back now. You haven't been off for a couple of weeks and had a break. Um, we've come back, and guess what? We're still in John chapter I know. <laughs> it was a bit of a shock, actually, yes. <laughs> I thought, if this is, surely, surely we'd have moved on by now, but, but no, apparently not. No, now it's sort of last gasp in, in John six this week, I think. Yeah, it is. But you better, we better remind uh, all the viewers where we are in the lectionary and what the particular passage is, because actually the choice of passage is again slightly unusual. It is, yeah. I mean, we're on Trinity thirteen, uh, yep. but the, the passage is John six fifty six to sixty nine. Yeah, which do, don't, you know, don't 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 adjust your set. That is that is the right passage, even though it overlaps with what we had last last week yeah it does it overlaps with it and also it sort of starts in the middle the natural yeah. section for it to start to start 52 yeah yeah because 52 to 58 sort of introduced and to 59 introduced the sort of the theme and yeah. then we get quite a change of focus from verse 60 on don't we yeah so my hunch is that they kind of give us these first few verses just to make sure that you we that, that, that the rest of it we know what they're talking jesus is talking about the yeah. disciples are talking yeah. about so it's a kind of yeah, it's just there to introduce the theme rather yeah. than yeah. necessarily be particularly the focus of our, you know, exegesis on its own. Yeah. Um, on the basis that probably you've talked about it last week. So, yeah. Now, James, you know very well that in classical music, uh, particularly in operas, what composers do is they give a little overture at the beginning where they introduce and give a little sample of all the tunes they're going to play they as do. the opera or as the drama unfolds. So they I wonder do. if we, it'd be nice to give our viewers a little overture of some of the things that we're going to talk about, because there's quite a few issues here, aren't there, in the past? There are, yeah, there, there, are, there are lots of issues, yeah. Um, I mean, one of them is obviously around this whole thing of flesh and blood and yeah. you know, how you read that and, and is it a metaphor and yeah and also i think there's a related question about how do we cope with trying to read a passage afresh and not through the lenses of the tradition that we've 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 come to it with yeah and that's particularly difficult isn't it here with with, mm. with john chapter six i think because the overtones of uh yeah. of eucharistic overtones and all that which which people tend to bring to it can be yeah. quite distracting and distorting yeah. if you're not careful and, and not yeah. and if you're not um, precise about the way in which the language is being used mm. yeah what are the other issues you think we're going to have to look at in this passage well i think we, we've got to look at the responses of the disciples mm. uh, and, in, and and that in the sort of widest group not just the 12 but the, the wider yeah. group because that's clearly yeah. um the the issue here mm. uh, comes comes up two or three times doesn't it mm. how sure. how are, how are how are they understanding what Jesus is saying in this rich yeah. language, which is uh, metaphorical language, but also how are they responding and what do they understand it to yeah. be saying about Jesus and also perhaps to be saying about their own need to, to uh, follow. So that's, yeah, um, that's, that's a, that seems to be a critical, I mean, an, another issue I think would be the, the point at which we have the language of the spirit here uh, yes. or of spirit, which, which is, um, which is a in a, a novel introduction into this part of the, the the passage isn't it so it is and i think one of the other things just generally speaking is that we do get lots and lots of different ideas coming quite fast paced one after the other and mm. after having had several passages which sort of turn the same ideas around and around and around suddenly a whole series of, of things comes up which we need to have yes a look at. yes yes so mm. then there's, there's stuff about the language associated with jesus by the disciples which we will yeah. we'll, we'll want to look at i think yeah um, so yeah, quite a lot to quite a lot to get your head round. Mm, yeah. Good. Mm. Okay. Well, let's dive in, shall we? Now, mm. interestingly, as as we mentioned, this passage overlaps with the end of the passage last week, and um, obviously we published. We didn't have a video, but we published a written blog uh, last week. And we begin, of course, with this whole thing, the end of the very long discourse around food, drink, the the bread from heaven, Jesus giving his flesh for the life of the world, uh, and and we get. I think probably it's fair to say uh, this passage in the in the section we have here of Jesus's speech, which we're coming into halfway through. Yeah, I think we have the most awkward, direct, challenging language about flesh and about food. So, verse fifty-three, yeah. Jesus says to them, "Truly, truly." So it's one of his "Amen, Amen" saying, "Yeah, yeah." Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, 
you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Um, and the, 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 mm. the power of this metaphor is so strong, it's really hard not to read it in some sense literally. And, of course, it, that seems to be why the, Jew, why the Jews, the, 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 the Jewish leaders perhaps in synagogue that Jesus is having to speak with, why they're struggling with this. Yeah, and, it, of course, it's perfectly possible that people interpreted it in different ways just as if you were to use a metaphor you know in a, in a preaching context today people some people will be more literal than others and some yes. people will be more metaphorical than others yeah. so it's perfectly possible to have a range of yeah. responses to this yeah. but yeah. It, what's what's interesting is the the as we get to the point where the disciples do respond to it um it what's i think particularly interesting is the way jesus responds to what the, to the disciples objection mm. as it were mm. uh, and i think that f uh, will unlock for us the way yeah. in which jesus un understood what he was saying yeah. um, and how he expecting us to interpret it yeah. yeah now three videos ago i did a little trailer at the end and said said to our viewers saying can you think of the different ways we use metaphors of food yeah. and of eating now in in two videos ago we never actually picked that up no, we didn't. We should. We should because no, we use yeah. our, we use uh, language of eating and food an enormous amount in our. We do our for all sorts of things. So yeah. if you go on Facebook, what do you actually see? You see your news feed. Feed, yeah. Mm. So <laughs> it's actually feeding you ideas. Yes, and you might talk about. Uh, read, if you read a book, you might say, "Well, I, I consumed it voraciously." Yeah, but, absolutely. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. We or, consume content, don't we? In, yeah, in, we do. We age. do. Yeah. 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 In fact, that whole sort of metaphor for modern life is that we are consumers. Yes, so that, yes. you know, and of course, when you're used to a metaphor and you're used to using it, it's actually, I mean, Paul Ricoeur is helpful here because he's got a mm. lot of stuff on metaphor. And he talks about metaphor sort of dying and, and then falling into the regular lexicon. So when you've used a metaphor time and time again, you no longer treat it as a metaphor yeah. because it's become part of the lexical range of meanings of that word. And I think consumerist, consumerism consumption is, is that kind of language. But we, we do use it all the time. Yeah. And, and as you say, we, we completely forget that it's, um, it's metaphorical. Yeah. Um, and and it, yeah, absolutely. Until somebody points it out. Mm. Um, and in the blog last week, I did actually finish with a quotation from Colin Cruz, who's written a new Tyndale right. New Testament commentary on John. And he says this, uh, the saying, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood must be understood as a graphic metaphor, meaning to believe in him. When it's unpacked, it means that Jesus is the source of eternal life and belief in him is the only way humans can satisfy the hunger and thirst for God. These sayings may remind modern readers of Jesus' words at, Lord's, at the institution of the Lord's Supper, but in their Johannine context, they are, are, to, are to be understood as a striking, even a confronting way of speaking about faith in him. So Colin is very, very definite about that in terms of its mm. metaphorical sense. Mm. Mm. And, and that does actually connect with things that Jesus himself has said. I mean, earlier in the gospel, I think he said that, hasn't he, that um, my food, that, that it was after the uh, encounter with the woman at the well. Yes, uh, in, my in, food in, is uh, to do the, yeah. yeah. My food, they said, have, where, where have you got your food? He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, of course, we get this, the, I mean, Colin Cruz's words hint at the use of this metaphor in the Sermon on the Mount in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger yes. and thirst uh, well, the righteousness. righteousness. Uh -huh. It's just that these things about hunger, hungering, thirsty and feeding, they're so sort of primal and, 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 and basic that that's why they become the, the source of these, this metaphorical language. Yes, and it, it's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus does relentlessly use this metaphor through mm -hmm. his ministry, um, something so fundamental to us, you know, actual food and drink, but yes. wanting to say to us that actual life in him obedience to him, living yes. his way, fellowship with him, abiding in him, as the right, fourth yeah. gospel would put yeah. it, yeah. is as fundamental as food and drink. And I think that is an enormous thought, isn't it? If we, yeah. if we think about how regularly we are hung, physically hungry, how regularly we are taking on board physical yeah. food, drink, whatever, yeah. then that, that really puts a perspective on our life in Christ. Yeah. Now, you used the word abide there, which of course mm. actually takes us into our first verse of our actual reading yes whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks uh, drinks my blood abides in me now yeah. ha -ha, here we have a very typical johannine feature we have the we have well we have the sort of trailing of something is to come although it has an antecedent as well because of course yeah. the language of abiding 
means staying. Yes. And of course, we talked about this before, that, that yeah. the very first questions the disciples ask him in chapter one is, where is, is, is uh, Rabbi, where are you abiding? Yes. And then you get this the double meaning, because of course, they're saying, well, where's your literal home? And he says, well, come and see. And in fact, <laughs> yeah. what Jesus is doing is inviting them to see that he abides in the Father and the Father yes. abides in him. Yes. And then, of course, we get in chapter 15, you know, the, the language of the vine and abiding in him, finding your home in him. Uh, and so you get that little idea that, that's going through just pops up here. Yeah. Now, I wonder if that ties in with your observation about how the later discussion about discipleship unlocks this language of feeding. But, of course, actually, we have a little hint of it here, haven't we? Because Jesus yeah. says, yeah. if you obey my commandments, you will abide in my love. Yes. In chapter 16. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that connects then the eating and drinking with obedience and listening to his teaching. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and I think we, we you have to read the language of flesh and blood and eating and drinking relentlessly in terms of abiding, living in obedience, following, walking, consuming in, his teaching, yes. consuming his teaching. Yes. All yeah. of that. Um, it is it's a very rich metaphor in that sense, yeah. isn't it? Um yeah. Now, again, we do get this Johannine thing, Jesus in, 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 in the fourth gospel of moving around and then binding in another idea, because it's very striking, beginning of verse 57, that uh, as the f living father sent me. Now, yeah. really, really a striking language. I don't yeah. think that phrase occurs I don't think it's, in the New Testament. I don't know. I don't think so. No. So we know that we've had ideas of life from chapter one. In him was light, and that light was the life of, of all, all people. And now again, we'll, we've got the, the, he is the living bread, yep. contrasted with Moses, who gave you just bread that was not alive. He's the bread. And of course, the pun there that he's the living bread, i.e. he's the bread of life. So he's the li bread that is alive, but also the bread that gives life. And then again, you get this whole idea of life wrapped in, with, in, in his relationship with the Father. And then anyone who feeds on him, the living bread, will then live because of him. Yes, it's the chain of life, isn't it, rather than the circle of life, um, which uh, mm. is it's very interesting because it's the life <laughs> from the Father to the Son yeah. uh, and, and, through, and from the Son to us through the Spirit. So you've got this, um, yeah, yeah. You, you, you're, you're tapped into the source yeah, yeah. very yeah. clearly. The other thing we should just note from our point of view of the language here, when again I commented in last week's uh, blog post, is the interchangeability where Jesus talks about bread, artos, but he also talks about food, brosis, yeah. and also broma. Uh, again, um, a reminder, I think we touched on this a couple of weeks ago, that we did. Hmm. In, in, in this culture where bread is such a common fare yeah. and that where diets are very simple, then the language of bread and language of food is used interchangeably because it's a staple. Exactly. Yeah, we did. We did talk about that. And I think somebody commented on the blog, actually. Mm. Yes, that's right. We did. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then we get to verse 58. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. So that's tying in both the contrast, yeah. the illusion, the parallel and contrast with Moses yeah. on the one hand, and then the theme of life and living. Yeah, yeah. Verse 59 gives a really surprising mm. information about location and geography, doesn't it? Mm. Well, we already know we're in Capernaum from earlier on in the chapter. But what we discover now is that we're actually in the synagogue in Capernaum. And, of course, yeah. anybody who's read uh, Mark's Gospel, for instance, or the Synoptics, yes. will know that there are other incidents that take place in Jesus' home synagogue yeah. in Capernaum. Yeah. Um, so it's very, very interesting just to get that bit of context here in order mm. to understand. And it will, we'll come back to that, I think, probably a bit later on in the passage where there is an mm. interesting connection. Mm. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah, right there in the synagogue. And I think this, this plays into, um, what the high priest says to Jesus at his trial, you know, um, where, or what Jesus says to the high priest, you know, I've, I've, I've been out doing all this teaching out in the open. Um, yeah. and, and in a couple of chapters, he, he, we, we're, uh, the, the writer of the fourth gospel tells us that um, Jesus was uh, teaching in the treasury, in the temple, in the treasury of the temple in, in chapter eight, I think it is. And uh, so there's uh, very much this kind of phrase is used to say he was quite open about everything he was doing. He wasn't, he wasn't hiding it away. And so when his words to the high priest, say, oh, I did it all open. We know that that's true because he's told us yeah. the stories of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting contrast with the synoptics where, you know, particularly in Mark, Jesus teaches in public and then it says, Katidian. when he's in home, he teaches and explains it to them. Yeah. Actually, the shape of the fourth gospel is that everything happens in public in the first part. 
and then you get the last level discourse, the teaching in the, private. The intimacy of, yeah. The intimacy in the second. Yeah. So it yeah. just completely right. re reconfigures that, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And even here in this passage where we do focus on the on the disciples rather than just the Jews, and when we focus even closer on the 12 rather than just the, yeah. the, all the disciples, nevertheless, mm. that's still all taking place in the context of yeah. of the public context in the, in the synagogue. Yeah, yeah. Now, James, we're halfway through. Friends, we're 15 minutes in, uh, so time to have a quick stretch. And also a reminder, there's four things we love our viewers to do, isn't there, James? Yes, indeed. Um, well, we'd love you to click like to the videos yep. on YouTube. That'd be great. Um, we'd love you to uh, share on the social media. That would be fantastic. Share on the on social. Your socials. Sorry, your socials. We, we just, I, I must watch my, I must keep, keep up with all the jargon here. Do share <laughs> yeah. on your socials whatever your yeah. socials might be yeah. and do subscribe to the channel yep. and do comment. Um, yes. We'd love, love to get some comments. Yeah. yeah. We have had some really interesting discussions in the last few weeks. So. Yeah, we have. Yeah. Really been fantastic. Yeah. Great. Well, after that half halfway through stretch, um, actually this is a natural break in the passage because we come to verse 60. So yeah. we've really got to change a focus. And I'm actually looking on my screen at a red letter uh, version. So the yeah. red letters tend to disappear. There's action here. And there's a really startling, well, there's, there's, a, there's a puzzle here to unlock. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? Yeah. So really interesting, isn't it, that Jesus... Um, Jesus' teaching is found to be challenging and is putting people off, which is really fascinating. That's not the sort of thing we want to do in our mission. Is not We don't want to put people off. But there's also a puzzle here, isn't it? This is a hard saying. Because one of the issues is, well, which hard saying is it that they are finding difficult? Or which hard sayings to come are they going to be put off by? Yeah, and, and this is quite a strong word for hard, harsh, scleros. It's, uh, I mean, it's yes, it is. Really, really, it's a tough, tough thing. So... Yeah, so the question is, I mean, what, what, what is it about what Jesus is saying that's a problem? Is it, is it his claim to come down from heaven? Is that a problem? Is it about his identity as yeah. heaven sent? Is it, is it the notion of eating his flesh? Is that somehow unpalatable? Yeah. Um, or is it, is it actually their understanding of what he's saying in terms of life coming through death, that, that he's, mm. he's got mm. to die? Is it a little bit like in the, in the synoptics where Jesus predicts his death and the disciples yes. don't like it? Now, what... Yeah. No. What, what is it of that, uh, in a sense, that, that's causing the problem? And I think the way in which um, Jesus responds to it, uh, yes. he says uh, he's aware that they're murmuring and complaining. Well, it's interesting that he says they're grumbling about this to themselves because it yes. sound, at first you might say that they're saying this to him, but actually they're but saying they're it not. to each other, aren't they? No, yeah. as, as so often he, he knows the yeah. kind of seems to, to, to pick up the sense of their conversation. By the way, interesting that here in verse 60, the fourth gospel is using the word disciple not to mean the 12, but to mean the wider group. I just Indeed. wanted that. Very important. Yeah. 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 It is I don't know if it's used language like that before, but. Um, no. Yeah. And as you mentioned, the hard work, scleros, a hard saying. And of course, that's sclerocardia, hard heartedness. Jesus rebukes the disciples mm. in the synoptics. Uh, and then uh, he, he says, do you take offense at this? And again, we get this, uh, this, the verb yes. scandalizomai. Yes. Uh, and a scandal on Jesus is a scandal. Yes. So there is yes. a sense in which, there is a right sense in which Jesus and his teaching, as we present it, people should find it scandalous. They should find it a stumbling block. Yes. Yeah. And he's sort of upping the ante in the, in the, in, in the conversation. Does this offend you? And, yeah. then, and then he says, you know, this is the, the crux, I think. Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Yes. Which rather points to the idea that Jesus' understanding of what he's been saying about eating his flesh and drinking his blood and all, all, all of this is yeah. actually really focused on his identity as the life giver, isn't it? And and the life giver through death. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but, but there's just an assumption too that if he is going to ascend to where he was before, he must have descended. He must have. He must have descended. Yes. And of course, this is, this is the point. Yes. Yeah, and this is going back to chapter one, where the word was with God, and then he, the word, became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and mm. downward movement, and then the upward movement back to the Father in the ascension. Of course, ironic that the fourth gospel doesn't actually talk about the ascension i mean it does talk about going to the father but, yeah but the ascension seems to be assumed again this is sort of more evidence that john is written for readers of the synoptics particularly mark's gospel because they already know the story so yeah. they so, so the writer expects us to pick up these these hints and these uh, allusions to things that that we know from the other gospels yes yeah 
again, another really surprising intrusion, another sort of Johannine twisting, wrapping in another another fresh idea. Suddenly, oh, the spirit is here, the Holy Spirit. Where's that come from? From yeah. that field. Yeah. And again, building on an idea we've just had earlier. So Jesus introduced the idea of life. Now we have the introduced the idea of the spirit who gives life. Yes. And of course, the spirit who gives is is the resurrection life of Jesus, isn't it? I mean, that's yeah. in, if we if we think forward on to Pentecost and, and so on, that's where the life of the Christian believer comes from. Yeah. Um, it's the life of the spirit. And of course, it's the it's the spirit of Jesus, uh, which yeah. is, which is, yeah. is his, his resurrection life. So once again, we we get that, um, you know, the, 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 the perspective is quite broad, isn't it? It's mm. in its it, mm. we mustn't get sidetracked into narrow conversations about flesh and blood and whether they like the idea of eating flesh no, no absolutely yeah but, and, no. and of course there's a little echo back there as well because in john 3 it's the spirit who gives life in a slightly oblique language which is of being born again yeah absolutely you have to be yeah. born you have to have new life from the yeah. spirit and and yeah 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 um but there's a paradox now introduced, and, and I know that um, you've been looking at this in commentaries and found the commentary there quite interesting. Suddenly, the word flesh, which previously has been positive because you eat Jesus' mm. flesh, which is about obeying, obeying his teaching, and you have life. Now the word flesh is quite negative. The flesh is no help at all. Yeah. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and of life. So you almost get a sort of Pauline sense of the word flesh here, meaning, you know, human nature, which is powerless to help itself. Yeah. Or, or you, could, you could take it like that, or you could take it that it, it means... It's something to do with the death of Jesus or the death of the disciples, but death oh. without life that follows. And, and I think, yeah. um, in a sense, you know, de death is, you know, a, a death is of no, no value. Uh, the, the, re the, the resurrection of Jesus is what, in a sense, mm. uh, proves the value of his death. But that's yeah. not what normally happens. You know, it's, in fact, it's uniquely happens with Jesus. So. Yeah. Um, I but wonder. it throws a spanner in the works of the yeah. idea again that this is a Eucharistic sort of section. Yeah, exactly, because... totally, totally, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because and and it's interesting that commentators who come from a more sort of Eucharistically focused theological background um, struggle with this. Um, Raymond mm. Brown really struggles with this. He doesn't really kind yeah. of get, yeah. get what this is on about. Um, yeah. 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 Um, there are some well again, again the connection between flesh spirit life and believing for there are some of you who do not believe yeah and then of course we get a lovely characteristic uh Johannine parenthetical statement so this happens yeah. a number of different times where you know the author takes us one side and said of course you know the reason why jesus said this is because he knew about this you know just to help us keep up with the story or fill in the details yeah yeah um, and then verse 65, we go back again to the Father, and there's a sort of a replaying in a slightly different way of some of these earlier sayings about being drawn by the Father, and also these are going to be developed later as well. No one can come to me unless, unless the Father, unless it's granted him by the Father. Yeah, so we, 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 earlier in, in, in 44, I think it is, um, you know, you, 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 you can't come unless you're drawn, and here the, the language has changed to the language of gift, isn't it the gift is the mm. gift of the father mm. to to mm. come uh to to the son yeah this is surely behind um the language of the trinity developed over the following centuries where you have here the integral action what the son does the father does those who have come to the son come because the father has drawn them and 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 the work that jesus does is the same as the work that the father does so you have this sense that the father and the son are working and willing together in parallel Yes, absolutely. And I think the language of gift is very important because I, um, over the years, I, I've often heard people talk about uh, coming to Christ and mm. very much in terms of something that really was all about them or was all about what they did. And I, yeah. I sometimes just gently say, well, that's, that's, that's interesting, but actually the New Testament talks about it the other way around because you wouldn't yeah. be coming to Christ unless the Father yeah. had drawn you and given you yeah. the gift. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I think that's quite an important thing for our own acknowledgement yeah well, isn't it also interesting how that idea of the sovereignty of god in this is yeah. also juxtaposed immediately with decisions about discipleship because then we yeah have, oh, yeah, yeah actually straight into 66 yeah many of these disciples turn back and no longer walked with him now yeah. that language of walking with him is fascinating isn't it yeah yeah it's the it's, it's the it's the only time in in uh, john where uh, the metaphor of of walking uh, with Jesus walking uh, the, as a disciple who walks with him is actually used, yeah. um, and yet it's once again we you know we talked about the metaphors of uh, of, of eating earlier on. 
but the yeah. metaphors of walking with are very, very important as well, aren't they? Yeah, in they a, are. in theological yeah. understanding. So, and of course, by contrast, in for instance, Luke, the middle section is all about Jesus walking somewhere, and that's exactly. a metaphor for a picture of you know yes. what it means to be a disciple with him. But yes, here it's unusual, as you say, the only place in the fourth gospel. Yes, I this whole little cluster here, uh, Jesus said to the twelve, all oh, the twelve. That's yeah. interesting. Are they? <laughs> Unless you've read Mark or the synoptics, you don't know what that means. So once again, we come back, we yeah. say it all the time. Yeah. John was written in order that yeah. for, for, for people who had already read the others. Yeah. 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 Now, on the one hand here, we get, again, characteristic of this fourth gospel, Jesus as the almost lonely Messiah figure, the lonely hero. Mm. That, you know, he, he is on his own. Although we mentioned the 12 here, the, the 12 don't really do much. He, he's no, the focus no, of the action. No, they're the foil, really. And so he's sort of elusive and a lonely. Now, look, I mean, I think my question reading this is, does that tell us something about who Jesus is, that he is set apart? Uh, or, or does it also tell us something about discipleship, that actually there's going to be a cost to staying faithful to him yeah. when, when others yeah. turn away? Yeah, and I suspect there's, the answer is a bit of both, isn't it? Mm. Um, yeah. Because both are, both are certainly true. And, and you, yeah, um, and and that the, the the idea that only a few, like particularly the twelve here, who affirm that they're not wishing to go away, via yeah. Simon Peter, um, yeah. but they they kind of saying, well, yeah, we get it, we understand that it's yeah. going to be lonely and it's going to be yeah. tough, but we're yeah. we're not going anywhere. Yeah. Um, and then Simon Peter, good old Simon Peter, he's always yeah. in the up. He answered, uh, "Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life." Now, your comment, uh, your anticipation is saying, "Aha! Here's another thing, which really is a key that unlocks the whole of this sort of narrative about food and consuming and Jesus." Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, Lord, it's the first time uh, a disciple has called Jesus Lord in in John. Well, oh. so that's quite. I think that's yeah. quite significant that it comes at this moment of decision, and in a sense. This is the equivalent of Mark eight, isn't it? And the the confession at Caesar of Philippi, and yeah. uh, you know, yeah, um, yeah. It, you can absolutely hear the echoes of, uh, of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the language also of um, you know we, we've come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. That's an extraordinary yes. statement, isn't it? And we're in the synagogue at Capernaum, and if you've read Mark, oh. you know that that's the language that the demons use, and the demon did use in Mark chapter yes. one. Yes, and now. It's on the lips of Peter. He's he's come to yeah. that realization through yeah. his journey with Jesus. What the demons know, because they know they they see the truth spiritually. Yeah, Peter has come to believe, and the disciples have come to believe. Mm. Um, mm. That's an extraordinary thing. And fascinatingly, this verse kind of draws together so many of the themes because we've got life, we've got words, we've got belief, yes. we've got come to know. And, yeah. and locating Jesus in relationship with the Father, the Holy One of God. Yeah. So it really fascinating the way that Peter's response draws draws these things and ties them together. Yeah, yeah. That's the end of our formal reading. Of course, there's two more verses in the chapter, which yeah. is a little aside about um, Judas. I suppose the lectionary compiler said, oh, that's a bit awkward to tell it on the end, so we'll just sort of chop it off. Um, yeah, odd, because, I mean, Jesus actually uh, mentioned Judas just a couple of verses before. Yeah. You know, to betray him, yeah. so I don't see why that that what that needs to be chopped out. But as we always say, who who knows the mind of a lectionary compiler? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the great mysteries of the universe, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is. There we go. Well, friends, we hope that those reflections have been useful to you. We hope and pray that they they do really bring the, the text alive. There's probably more there than you'll cover in one sermon out of thought don't you think james yeah i thought so there's a lot to i think it's one of the classic ones where you have to focus don't you and yeah and 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 and, and don't try and cover too much ground yeah yeah Yeah. and i think just a reminder as well that in preaching the most important thing is not so much what the disciples do what people have responded but the key thing here is what does this text tell us about who jesus is and what god has done for us in him yeah and there's plenty of stuff to bring out there so yeah don't forget to do those four things. If you can click like, if you want to comment, you can share on your socials. Yeah. Uh, and oh, I've forgotten what the fourth thing was. Subscribe I don't know. to the channel. Oh, subscribe as well so you don't miss future videos. And uh, we're back in the swing of things. Uh, James isn't going away again and taking time off, so we'll see you again next week. James, look forward to seeing you then. Yes, indeed. And friends, see you next week. Thanks for joining us.